God is good. John doesn't drink coffee. He doesn't watch football. Pray for Pastor John, Mark. We are in the book of Philippians in the New Testament, if you'd like to turn there to chapter 4. If uh, you have not been with us in our recent studies, we've been plowing through the prison epistles of the Apostle Paul, all of them written while he was under house arrest in Rome awaiting trial. He'd been accused of horrendous things by the Jewish religious leaders, and he had appealed his case to Caesar as a Roman citizen. He had that right. But he sat there waiting for his accusers to show up, and after two years when they never did, uh, Nero let him go. But for the two years he was under house arrest, he took the opportunity to not only tell every one of the guards that he was chained to about Jesus Christ and introduce the Lord to the household of Caesar, but he wrote these precious epistles that are in front of us. Where would we be without his epistles? These, the church at this point in time is some 10 to 12 uh, years old, and they had sent him a love offering. He was in a rented house, if you read in Acts chapter 28. Uh, he, it was a, he wasn't in jail per se. He was more under house arrest, but chained 24-7 to these Roman legionary troops. Uh, but he had to pay for his own house. Well, that's tough to do when you don't have a job and you're chained to people and you can't get a job. And so the Philippians, once they found out where he was at and uh, and the the situation, uh, they brought an offering for him. But they couldn't do it immediately. They spent some time looking for him, weren't sh quite sure where he was at. So he writes basically this letter about rejoicing in thankfulness, something Christians don't do near enough of. Rejoicing. I can't always rejoice in my circumstances, but last week's study told me I can always rejoice in God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves us. He's got everything under control. You're going to heaven. It's okay. Don't get so serious about all the stuff that goes on down here. It is so temporary. So temporary. And the God who is in charge of the whole universe created it all, every living thing in it, on it, above it, underneath it, is coming back soon. Uh, it's the hope of the church. And until then, he's given us books like this to strengthen us and encourage us. That only happens to the extent that you put it into practice. I can preach it all day long. But until you personally put the things that I say and these words into practice, they don't do you any good. It's kind of like getting a, a Lego's Titanic model for Christmas like my son did. If you don't read the directions, you're not going nowhere. 48 pounds worth of Lego boxes in bags by the billions of pieces it looked like, and there was no instructions at all in the top of the box. And I thought, oh, Lord, are we in trouble. I had, what are you supposed to do? Look at the picture on the front of the box and make these 10,000 pieces look like that? Where do you begin? We unpacked the box, found the directions at the bottom. We opened the wrong end of the box. It happens. <laughs> this book gives you all of the instruction you need to successfully navigate every difficulty you'll ever have in life. This book is sufficient because it was written by a God who is sufficient. And you will be tested on whether you actually believe that or not by the trials in this life that you go through. It's one thing to say, I know God. But there's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing him in a personal and intimate way because you pray, because you seek his face, because you study his word. And every day you're looking for the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh with resources you do not have. There is only one way to conquer sin in your life. And that's not to try harder to conquer your sin. It's to seek him more diligently. He will conquer the sin for you. He didn't ask you to do that. That's his job. But you've got to put yourself often enough and deep enough into his presence that these things happen. If you strive to get a handle on your sin to the neglect of the person who is able to make you holy, you're barking up the wrong tree. Every Christian I know that ever tried to get a handle on a sin that was a constant in their life, the harder they tried, the worse they failed. And when they failed, there was more shame, more guilt. 
more sense of I don't deserve anything from God. But the Christians that put their sin over here, it's still there, but their eyes are on the Lord. And as they're growing in the Lord, the sins start falling away. Get first things first. Because you can join all the 12-step programs on planet Earth and not obtain the spiritual victory that Jesus Christ died to give you. If you could do it without him, then you don't need him. You can save yourself. Yeah, how's that working for you? It doesn't. It never has. It never will. The Jews got mixed up on it. Well, if we just try hard enough uh, to adhere to the law, if we just knuckle under and try harder, try harder, but they left God out of the equation, and they failed miserably time after time after time after time. I know so many Christians that are still in bondage to sin because they don't give it to God. They try hard to get a handle on their sin, but they don't try that hard to get in God's presence and let him strip away the garbage. One will leave you very frustrated if you try to go through life as a legalistic Christian thinking, well, I, if I just try harder, then, it'll, then I can get rid of this sin. No, you can't. It requires a supernatural spiritual surgery. You're not able to do that. You're not the great physician. Does that just make sense? So if you want to lower your frustration level today, let go and let God Stop throwing the pity party. Stop thinking the world has the answers or I just need another counseling session or I just need to buy an, a new bestseller Christian book in the bookstore. If you're trying anything without including Jesus Christ as the very center of this, you're doomed to defeat. I just want you vigorous, prosperous, victorious. Do we have to do this God's way? You already know that you've tried it other places ways, and it hasn't worked. That's why you're still in bondage to your sin. Pursue Christ. The sins fall away. The answer is Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And Paul has reminded us that for a four or three and a half chapters uh, at this point. The Lord told me this morning that my job is to strengthen and encourage you. That's all I want to do this morning is strengthen and encourage you. It came out of my Bible reading this morning in Acts 15 in verse 32. And, and the best way to do that is not just tell you how to change, but to come alongside of you and try to encourage you to change, to give it to the Lord. Saying, Lord, I feel sorry for you in situation it may be empathetic, but it doesn't help you much. If I come alongside of you and say, this is the word of God, let me help you put it into practice, it does you much more good to actually help people. You know, Paul was often in distress, often in prison, and through it all, amazingly, he learned over time, it wasn't something that he arrived at overnight, he, over time he learned to be content. Content, that's a word that's going to come up a lot in this morning's reading. Why is that important? <clears throat> How content are you this morning? Are you content with where God has you? Or do you constantly complain about where you're at? Whether financially or spiritually or, or from a health standpoint, are you content? Uh, maybe you're not objective. Maybe you should ask somebody who loves you enough to tell you the truth and ask them, do I strike you as being content do I strike you as being happy with where I'm at, with what God has given me, or do I complain too much? Be careful. They may tell you the truth. God wants us contented. He's here this morning offering us the ability, <coughs> excuse me, to be content in every and every situation. So let me help you do that. As I look at the Philippian letter that Paul writes, despite the fact he's sitting in jail, there's not a single word of complaint found anywhere in these four chapters. Not a single word of complaint. Now, if he can find contentment in jail, why can't you where you're at? It's pretty simple. I think that it is a special grace of God and certainly the most telling sign of spiritual maturity to have an even disposition and temperament of mind 
in all circumstances. That's a mark of Christian maturity. I'm even keeled. I don't fly off the handle. I'm not ultra happy, ultra depressed. I'm not bipolar. I'm not manic. I'm not weird. It is a gift of God to be in the midst of difficulty but not lose our faith. Our faith in God and receiving comfort from God. It's a gift from God that I can trust in his provision. It may be hard now, but do I believe that he loves me and he's going to take care of me? Yeah, I do believe that. Or do I give way to that spirit of complaint? Complaint. And there's plenty in this lost and fallen world to complain about, isn't there? But to complain or not is a choice. How, how effective is complaining anyway? I mean, does that radically change your life? Does that help you in your employment situation when you complain to your boss? Does that help a lot? Does that help your attitude? Does it minister in Jesus' name? <laughs> I think that sometimes prosperity is a harder lesson to learn than poverty because the temptations are greater. When you're broke, you can't sin as much. In verse 10, Paul starts this new section as he closes out this precious, though tiny little letter. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you, at last, you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned, say learned, I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances. He's thankful for them sending him some financial support. And the delay hadn't been because they were indifferent. Most likely they simply had difficulty locating him. It's not like they could dial him up on his cell phone or something like that. You know, the, the money had been in route for some time. I'm sure that Paul was in a situation where the rent's due tomorrow morning and I don't have a penny to my name. I have no job. I'm chained to this Roman legionnaire. What's going to happen? He trusted God. It was a test of his faith. He was right where he was supposed to be. The test of his faith was given by God. How can you complain about something that God gives you? You may not like it in your flesh, but that's your flesh talking, not your spirit. You need to learn that God is faithful. He doesn't respond to your complaining. complaining. He responds to your faith. God, I believe you're going to come through. I know you're going to take care of me. I know you love me. You got this. You don't want me to worry or hassle about anything. When he says in verse 11, I have learned, it's worded in such a way in the original language that Paul says, I myself had to learn this lesson. I don't know if any of you need to learn this lesson, but I myself need to learn at this point in time this lesson. The hardships that you face this morning are God-given. Don't murmur, grumble, or complain. There's a lesson to be learned there. That's why God has you there. That's what Paul realized. I realized that right here, right now, in this instance, it's worded in the aorist tense, which is a point-in-time event. This trial, I'm here by the will of God. You'll remember that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was pouring his heart out to his heavenly Father. He said, Lord, if there is any way that this cup can be taken from me, this cup of suffering, if there's any other way for mankind to be saved, Lord, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. The cross was part of God's plan to redeem you and I. It wasn't pleasant for Jesus to go through. He's setting us an example. You have to go through difficulties in this life. Jesus promised that in his world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, which means you have not overcome the world, but he has. The closer you get to him, the more victory you experience. You cannot overcome the world. He already has, which is why you and I must, when we go through the inevitable difficulties of life, don't complain. 
It's a test of your faith. Do you really trust God? Are you praying about it? Are you searching out the word? Are you getting wise and godly counsel about this? Because it's easier to sit in front of the couch, eat bonbons, turn on the soap operas, and feel sorry for yourself. But if you haven't noticed, that doesn't help. It doesn't solve anything. The world is out there providing endless amounts of distraction, but not help. The world offers no help. It just offers temporary, unsatisfying distraction, whether it's your computer, your TV, your cell phone. You know what I mean. There is, you can entertain yourself through these media devices today 24-7. How much of it will help you in your spiritual journey? then why do you make such an investment of yourself in social media and TV and entertainment? Why? Can I tell you why? You've bought into the lie from the pit of hell. Satan wants you distracted. He doesn't want you in the word of God. He doesn't want you growing in your faith. He doesn't want you turning to God. He doesn't want you holding hands with Christian brothers and sisters and being anointed with oil and looking forward to the miracles that God's going to do. He doesn't want to do that. So he will send you any amount of entertainment it takes to keep you spiritually off track. His plan works brilliantly in the lives of most Christians. It results in a Laodicean lukewarm church in the last days that's obsessed with the same things, the same exact things the world is obsessed with. As Paul's sitting in jail, he's not thinking, boy, you know, if I just had a few more hours on social media, you know, if I could just hit this latest TV show that's out there, man, if I could, you know, entertainment wasn't even on his agenda. And yet it's such a prominent part of the Christian experience today. And we pursue it as vigorously as the world does. But there's no spiritual depth to any of that. It's just distraction. It distracts your flesh. And if Satan can keep you in the flesh, you'll never be victorious in the spirit. Which do you think pays greater eternal dividends? Walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit? Then start choosing better. Look at your priorities. Where are you spending your time? Is there any improvement that is possible to make a greater spiritual investment? That's what Paul did, and that's why he could sit in jail, chained between two people, potentially awaiting execution, and the theme of this letter is joy. Now, he's either tremendously bipolar and needs to be medicated, or he's really in touch with a supernatural peace that eludes most of us. But Paul said, I was right there just where you are. But here's what I've learned. I have learned the secret of being content. In other words, it's possible to learn that. It's possible to be sitting in jail awaiting execution and be rejoicing in the Lord. It's possible to do that. Because most Christians say they don't believe that's possible. We read it on and go, yeah, well, that's great. That was Paul. He probably walked on water on his off days, too. I think he's just as real as you and me, just as frail as you and I, just as has as many struggles as you and I, but he knew a supernatural source of strength, and he plugged into it constantly. He plugged into it constantly. You have to stay. My wife has a cell phone. I hate cell phones. I don't have one. If you want to call me, call my wife. <laughs> she'll, she'll get hold of me. She knows where, where I'm at all the time. But, I, but I, I noticed something about her cell phone. If you don't charge it up once in a while, it's no good to, at all. It's worse than a brick. You've got to plug it in once in a while. How many of you have learned that lesson the hard way? You've got to plug it in once in a while. What, the, the Christian has to be plugged in once in a while. To God's word, you want some power, you want some strength, you got to get plugged in, and regularly. And you want to have that top charge put on there, you know? Man, you just, you don't have the power that it takes to successfully navigate all of the trials of this life, but God does. 
You've got to plug into the power source. But I'm surprised at how much time we spend on social media and how little time we spend in the Word of God. How much time we spend on our cell phones and computers and televisions, and it's nothing compared to how much we, we, we spend in God's Word. We don't, don't spend, we'll watch TV for eight hours a day, and we're lucky to get in ten minutes with God. And at some point in time, Paul says, you have to learn how wrong that is. You have to learn that that's a strategy from the pit of hell. It is not God's will. But a powerless church obviously is one that has not plugged into the power source. How's your prayer life? Are you reading the Word of God daily? Are you surrendering? Do you have the praise and worship playing at your house? Or is the TV on 24-7? You don't want the world to program you. You leave it on and you be talking to Alexa all day long. Can I tell you? The world's programming you. It's not the Lord. Turn on some praise and worship music. Have that playing in your home. It sets an, an atmosphere that will benefit you greatly. Paul says, I have learned, verse 11, I have learned, I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, whether I just got fired from my job, whether I got hired, whether I got a raise, whether I got passed over, whether my car broke down or I had a flat tire, I'm, I'm okay, I'm good. These things shall not upset me. One time, Paul, later on in his ministry, would, would go to the church and they said, you know, when you go to Jerusalem, we're going to bind you up. And they took off his belt and he bound his hands with it symbolically. And he said, why are you guys breaking my heart? It doesn't matter what awaits me. But I know that every opportunity is an opportunity to glorify God. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. If it's the will of God, I'm all down with it. Boy, that takes a mature mindset, doesn't it? What bothers you? What's it take to rob you of the joy of your salvation? What's it take for Satan to rip you off and rob you of your peace? can be such little things that don't matter in the the long term. I think these are tests that God sends your way just to show you as a diagnostic tool where you're at spiritually. And you need a greater source of strength. You're you're down there at 10% on your cell phone capacity and you go, Lord, I need to plug in. I need to, to build this back up. My wife discovered something just yesterday because she got a new phone because the other one got hot enough to use for a hand grenade. I didn't know they could even do that, but things go wrong in a sinful, fallen world. Uh, But it charges slowly. When we were at at, uh, the phone store, and they they put hers on this inductive charging thing, and after an hour, it only came up an additional 10%. (sighs) Well, that's all I wanted to do was spend all eight hours on my day off in the phone store, right? watching my wife's phone charge. It takes time. Time in God's Word to mature, to get your spiritual batteries recharged again. As long as your spiritual batteries have been neglected, it will take that long to recharge them. Don't neglect your spiritual batteries. Plug in every day. Seek the face of God. You've got to to learn these things. Satan, I think, has devoted himself to making us as discontented with our lives and circumstances as he possibly can. Pride and unbelief and longing after something we do not have and fleshly dissatisfaction with the things that we do have make even the best Christian people discontented under even the best of circumstances. Let's pray for patient submission when we go through the trials of this life uh, and, and turn to him for hope when circumstances humble us. Let's ask for the mind of Christ when we go through these things. Let's seek to be so filled with his Holy Spirit that what people see when we go through our inevitable trials is love and joy and peace and patience, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Don't explode. Don't let your anger get the best of you. 
If you have an anger management problem today, you have a spiritual problem. Now, you can blame it on everything else. Well, I have PTSD. What are you doing about it? Well, you, you don't know what a wretched father example I had. I know what a heavenly father example you have before you. Everything else starts sounding like an excuse. Everything else starts sounding like an excuse. Oh, you don't know me, Pastor Jim. You don't know my situation. God does. I'm not your help or your hope, but God is. Are you turning to him? That's, that's really the issue. I'm encouraged where Paul says, I have learned, then there's hope that I can learn it. There's hope that you can learn it. If Paul can learn it, so can any of us in this room. In this particular situation that God has allowed, I needed to learn this lesson. He's saying a practical lesson to be content. What, what Paul is saying is, verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here's the secret. Here's what I've discovered. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the secret. He just told us how to learn that secret of being content. It is a personal, daily, experiential walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not ultimately, Paul says, dependent upon anyone or anything except God. But the glorious encouragement to me is if Paul can learn it, so can I. So can you. But I don't want Satan to tie me to a spirit of discontent because my eyes are on myself or my situation more than God. I don't want to give the victory to Satan. Prosperity, too, Paul says in verse 12. That can be a source of discontent as well. Again, Paul notes, I have learned. How do you learn it? Well, number one, by knowing Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Have you confessed uh, that you are a sinner to him and asked him to forgive you your sins? Do you believe he's the son of God, died on the cross for you, rose from the dead on the third day? If you believe these things, it, that's where it starts. You know him not know about him. Any pagan can grab an encyclopedia and learn about Christ. Do you know him? Does he know you? It's critical. That's where it all starts. And then by going through whatever situation he allows in my life, depending upon him and his resources rather than me and my resources. Why is it that the first time we go through a hard time, the first thing we want to do is complain to somebody else about it? Hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, sister, hey, brother, you, here's what I'm going through. Oh, that'll help. Just keep complaining. Look how well it worked for the nation of Israel in their wilderness wanderings in the book of Exodus. Look how well that pleased God to complain. In fact, doesn't it say in Scripture, do everything without complaining? You wouldn't have to say that to a people if they didn't struggle with that. Here's your lesson for today. Don't complain. Would you say that with me? Don't complain. There will be a test. <laughs> I want to experience this peace regardless of what I'm going through. It's called a secret because it escapes most people. It escapes most Christians. Either people don't know you can have peace in a trial or they don't care enough to trust Jesus in that trial. Notice I can be, verse 12, content in any and every situation. Can you say that? Is your disposition even-tempered regardless of what you're going through? That should be our goal, to be even-tempered. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not the fruit of you. It happens as you abide in Christ. You bear much fruit Jesus said in John 15, remember that? It's the root of the Holy Spirit. So this stuff doesn't happen unless you're in his presence. You don't read, it'll never happen. You don't pray, it'll never happen. You don't worship, it's not going to be there. You'll never have peace. You're not doing it God's way. You have to do this stuff God's way, and that should be our goal. This is a lesson that we must learn. Uh, by actively seeking to be spirit-filled, abiding in the Lord, bear, bearing his fruit, 
The fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know it. Galatians 5 and verse 22 and 23. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. What's it look like when you're in touch with him? Here's what it looks like. Maybe this describes you and maybe it doesn't. Do a little self-test here. Are you full of the Holy Spirit? Are you full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and, guys, gentleness? And last but not least, self-control. Some of you hate that word, don't you? Self-control because you have none. You have no ability to say no to sin. You just dwell in it. You're right there. You wonder, I guess I'm condemned to be a lukewarm Christian the rest of my life. You pursue Christ and you can watch that stuff fall away. You don't have to live in defeat or despair. Christ died to open the cell door. Walk out. It's really simple. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you need more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that I've just elucidated for you, then invest more in your daily walk with the Lord. Read. Read the Word of God. Don't know where to begin. Gospel of John, chapter a day. Questions? It's not rocket science. Read, pray, worship. Share your faith with other people. Get outside of yourself. Other people are suffering all around you. Get outside of yourself and invest in them. Pray with them. Love on them. Encourage them. Paul says, verse 13, highlight this one. <laughs> I can do, it says in you, all things through him who gives me strength. That's Jesus. If you're close, you got strength, and nothing upsets you much. Flat tire? Eh. Furnace doesn't work? It seldom does. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't, these things don't matter. The car's got to go to the shop. Yeah. We caught a cold. Big deal. Got nothing to eat but macaroni and cheese. I have learned the secret of contentment eating macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength. If you put hot dogs in it, you can call it gourmet. <laughs> Add peas and you've got a daily meal that's nutritionally balanced. <laughs> Paul says in verse 14, yet it was good of you guys. It really was good of you to share in my troubles. You did something about it. You didn't just say, oh, poor Paul. You, you sent some money to help me may, pay the rent. I'm, I'm really grateful for it. I can do everything. Boy, that's emphatic in the original. I can do everything, all things through him who gives me strength, but only through him. Only through him. It is Christ who gives me strength, literally who empowers me. The Greek word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite and dynamo. That's a supernatural power source. I can't whip up, and it's a present active participle. I can continually go through everything when I look to the one who continually gives me strength. It's a participle, continuous and ongoing action. My, my union with the living, exalted Christ, it's the secret of contentment and gentleness and strength. Your daily walk, it's everything. Ignore your daily walk, you turn into the old you before you were saved. What did that look like? Re let me remind you, you were a Cretan. So I don't even know what that is. Look it up. Look it up. It's not good. You know, this is such a key verse. Verse 13 is. It's one of the key verses in the entire New Testament, along with John 15 and 5, where Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I remain in him, he will bear much fruit because apart from me, Jesus said, you can do what? Nothing. Why do we try then? Why do we try to do all this stuff apart from him? When he said it plainly, apart from me, you can do nothing. You doom yourself to defeat if you try to go through life apart from him. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, but he said to me, uh, the Lord speaking to the apostle Paul, uh, when Paul had asked for healing, he said, mm, no, no. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast, Paul says, more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. It's not the power of the flesh 
It's the power of Christ. It's your relationship with him and the degree of intimacy that tells you what the degree of your victory. It's it's one-on-one relationship. Paul would write the Ephesian believers another prison epistle, and he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. It's a spiritual surgery. Far from me, you can do nothing. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Filled to all of the fullness with God. That means because your heart and mind aren't attached to this world, nothing that happens in this world bothers you. I'm just walking, I'm just passed through, I'm a stranger, an alien in every sense of the word, and someday he's going to take me to my rightful home. He will write the church of Colossae in chapter 1 and verse 10, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit, that spiritual fruit of the Holy Spirit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. If you don't have endurance and patience, look at the connection. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Paul says in verse 15, back in Philippians 4, the moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, I set out from northern Greece, Macedonia. Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. You guys have been so great. Not that I'm looking for a gift. That's not why I'm writing you. I just wanted to say thank you. And I love you guys. And I thank you for your prayers and your care and your concern. But I am looking for what may be credited to your account. For I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus, your messenger, the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. Notice your financial giving to support the cause of Jesus Christ is held to your eternal glory. You give as God lays on your heart. Read what God's word has to say about this matter of giving. But you all of your fragrant offerings, it's an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. You give to God, and here's the promise in return, verse 19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You put God as first priority, he'll take care of you. He'll send you tests regularly to show you where you're at spiritually. You blow up. You get mad. You take things in your own hand. You fret or you worry. And then the Holy Spirit will just park in your left ear and go, when's the last time you read? You need strength you don't have. Where's that gentle spirit that Pastor Jim talked about on Sunday? No, that's not me speaking in your ear. I am not the Holy Spirit, but he can be depended upon to bring things to your remembrance that Jesus has said. And then you have a choice to make, to listen to that still small voice or blow it off and let Satan distract you. Your choice. But know this, it's a test. It's a heaven-sent test. The things that you occupy yourself with are the things that will rule over you. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You love the one and hate the other. So you can't serve the world and Satan and Jesus Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit simultaneously. It it doesn't happen that way. Verse 19, I want you to just feel free to highlight that one because it's in response to you giving it all to God, not just your financial offering, but giving your heart and mind and soul and strength to the Lord. He wants that more than he wants anything you possess. He doesn't need your money. Think about that for a second. Who created every molecule of gold and silver in the universe? 
He needs what of yours? Nothing. What does he want of you? Everything. Everything. He gave it to you to be a good steward for a short time. Be a good steward of everything, of your time, of your money, your talents. Be a good steward of these things because there's a day of accounting. Now, it says there in verse 19, and my God will meet. That's future tense in the original language. That means you've got to go through the trial a while. You have to learn your lesson, and then he's going to take care of you if you turn to him. In the future, notice the, notice the progression. You've got to go through the trial. You've got to turn to him. He will take care of you. But you've got to go through the trial so that you can turn to him to find out that he is sufficient. That's how your faith grows. And there isn't another way for your faith to grow rather than to go through things and find out how faithful God is, how much he loves you. Now, some of you are just too young to appreciate the lesson. You're under 50. So you may struggle with, with finding out some of the things us old folks have learned the hard way. We don't want you to have to learn the hard way. What we old folks have learned is that Christ is sufficient. Amen. And you turn to him and all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called to glory and spirit. We old folks, we know that. You think, no, you're just old. Well, yes, that's true. But the experiences that I've gone through in 71 years, you would benefit from greatly. Christ is the answer to it all, dear friends. That's what I have found out, that God is able. God is loving. He is right there. He possesses resources I could not have imagined when I got saved at 19. I could not have imagined all of the trials that lay ahead of me the day I got saved in my little 10-foot by 40-foot mobile home in Oklahoma City with tornadoes rattling all around. I, I would not have ever known how great God is if he hadn't allowed me to go through those trials so he could show me his greatness. I, the trials display the glory of God. And so I praise his holy name. That's why James says, you count it all joy when various trials come. He was an old guy like me when he wrote it. He could look back at how faithful God had been. For how long? Well, I'll tell you, that's what you want to glean from the elderly in the church is the faithfulness of God because they have seen God come through 10,000 times. You have not. They've lived through it. They can tell you that God is faithful, that prayer works, staying close to Jesus and being filled with his Holy Spirit. They can tell you, man, there's no other way. Been there, done that, got that T-shirt for crying out loud. Learn from the people that have been there. God is so faithful, so faithful. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Everything that we need. God says it's yours for the asking. But if you don't ask, you get what? Nothing. James says, we have not because we ask not. I know this is pretty simple for some of you. I'm not saying this because you don't know this. I'm saying this because you don't do this. It's not a matter of what you know. Knowing won't get you anywhere. But to the extent you put it into practice, ah, Jesus can give you the life you've always dreamt of. Give you peace that passes all understanding, guarding your hearts and your minds. Whew. Nothing bothers me. I hear from Christians all the time, oh, this guy's just pushing my buttons. Who told you you have the right to have any buttons? Huh? What is that? That's blaming other people for your inappropriate response spiritually. Call it for what it is. Man up, woman up. Own that one. There's room for improvement in my spiritual walk. Then address that issue. If I wake up to a flat tire in my car in the morning, I can complain about it till the cows come home. But the bottom line is we're not going anywhere till I change the tire. 
Do something about it. If God shows you an area that you need to work on in your spiritual walk, whether it's the area of reading or prayer or sharing your faith, going to church, worship, if God's showing you that, do something about it. It's the flat tire in the driveway, and it's not going to go away. I mean, maybe you're in your living room praying that God would send you somebody that would change your tire. No, that's not the way that works. <laughs> you, ha- you, you, you have to do something about your spiritual condition, and no one else can do that for you. God's just waiting with open arms saying, why don't you come to me? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He didn't say, I'm going to bust your chops. He didn't say, I'm going to make you anxious or fretful. Or, oh, gee, what do I do about this? That's not God. That tells me more about where you're at spiritually than anything else. And it looks bad. We say that we're Christians, and we freak out more than the pagans. Does that inconsistency seem wrong. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has given us, has already given us, everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Mm, I love that. I, I am in the habit from time to time of reading a little devotional book by a guy who died just after World War I named Oswald Chambers. He died when he was only 33 years of age. He gave his heart and life to Christ, though. And in his little devotional book, My Utmost, for his highest, he said this. The secret of power and contentment is found in Jesus. In our personal, daily Walk with him. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven thirty three. 33. Our Lord's words are not do this and do that, whine and complain and look to everybody else, but simply come unto me. If I will simply come to Jesus, Oswald Chambers says, my real life will be brought into harmony with my real desires. I will actually cease from sin, and I will find the song of the Lord stirring within my heart. Uh, He had discovered that secret that Paul was talking about here. It's intimacy. It is intimacy with Christ. Not just flipping through the pages or going to church, whatever. Getting the skeptical attitude. He goes on to continue in his little devotional for that day. When is the last time you simply came to Jesus? Would you rather do anything than this one simple childlike thing? Come to me. If you really want to experience peace and victory over sin, you must come to Jesus. How much? How often? Till you have the peace and victory that he has promised. That's it. You stay. How long do I need to read my Bible, Pastor Jim? Till you have the peace of God that transcends all understanding. It's simple. Jesus Christ makes himself the test to determine the genuineness of our faith. At the most unexpected moments in your life, there is this whisper of the Lord. Oswald Chambers says, come to me. And you are immediately drawn to him. Personal contact with Jesus changes everything. Wise man at 33 years of age. He didn't know that the Lord was going to call him home in the peak of his prime. So he wrote fervently and furiously, and God used him greatly, and we've been reading the words that God had laid on his heart ever since. Maybe God's calling you and I to be the next Oswald Chambers, the next Billy Graham, or maybe you're a Billy Graham or Billy Graham-us, uh, moving in that direction, growing into that role. You don't know what Christ has called you to, but if you pursue him, he will show you. Keep pursuing him. That's what Paul says. 
I have learned that secret. Few are finding it. Few going to church in Colorado Springs on February 11th at 1130. Few in Colorado Springs have found that secret. Don't let it escape you. You now know how to learn that secret. All you got to do is plug in. Be a good cell phone. Let's stand and close in prayer, shall we? Four o'clock today, church doors be open. Bring your hamburgers, your hot dogs, your potato chips, your whatever. We will eat them all, I promise. I'm bringing 24 hot dogs, so the first 24 people to get in the door get a hot dog. 23 people, I have to save one for myself. Pastors lead by example. Hey, it's my cross to bear. You're a good God. You love us so much. Thank you, Father. You have been teaching me these many years that the secret to victory over sin, the secret to joy and peace and contentment is you. I want to be as close to you as I can be. I want to be as filled with your Holy Spirit as I can possibly be. I want to seek you with all of my heart and mind and soul and strength. I believe that you love us that you have a wonderful plan for our lives. All that you ask in return is for us to draw close, to seek and ask and knock. When we ask, you answer. When we seek, we find. When we open the door of our hearts, you come in and you make our hearts your home. Thank you, Lord. If there's anybody in this place that doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, on a personal level, basis, if they've not repented of their sins and asked you to be the Lord of their life and forgive them their sins, I pray that they just pray that simple prayer right here and right now. That they just say it in their heart of hearts. They don't even have to say it out loud. They just have to mean it. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins. I know you're the Son of God. I know you died on the cross to pay the penalty my sins deserved. And I know you rose from the dead on the third day. Be my Lord, my God, and my Savior. I give you my life. I seek you with all that is within me. And I thank you for saving me. God wants to do such a miracle in your heart. For those of you that have, are Christians and have walked for a long time with the Lord but have not walked in peace and love and joy and victory, that's available for you today. Open the door door of your heart. Let him show you how far you have fallen short. Confess to him the lack of patience or love or joy or contentment and ask him to give you that peace and love and joy and contentment. Fruit only he can produce in your life. Let him have his way with you this morning. He loves you so much. So much. Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves into your hands. You're a God who has since eternity past wanted to bless. You created us so you could make us an object of your love and show us what forgiveness looks like. In you we find our strength. Renew our hope this morning. Give us that even and pacific character. Give us the peace that passes all understanding. May we be obsessed with heavenly things, not earthly things. May we find our contentment in you and not the distractions of this world. May we be devoted to the reading of your word and prayer and worship. Come into church and share. Thank you for what you're doing right here, right now, Father. In Jesus' name.